my name is Philip Martin, and I'm really excited to uh, have a conversation today with Rima Galoom, whose work is featured both in our current exhibition, uh, The Holographic Principle at Philip Martin Gallery, and in an online presentation. I'm really delighted that you guys could join us today on a beautiful morning here in sunny Southern California or wherever you might be. I hope you've had a chance to meet Portia, the co-owner of the gallery, and to come by and see the show that features Rima's work, which closes tomorrow. And of course, uh, we're really excited about the ongoing show that we have of her work online and some of the projects that are happening. Rima, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you. Yeah, you've got a lot going on. I mean, obviously, here's the install shot of our show, but your work has been in San Francisco. Your work has been uh, in New York recently. There's a lot of opportunities that people have to see your work. And I really appreciate the opportunity to just get a chance to talk to you. I have really been watching your work and having um, and really enjoyed getting to know you and I and just enjoying the pace of your paintings. And here is a painting, Night Prayer. It's a very large new painting that's in our show. Do you want to sort of just talk a little bit of, with the audience about, I mean, your work or where would you like to start? Yeah, I mean, this painting is a good place to start. It's it's kind of the tallest painting that I've ever made. Uh -huh. And um, and I actually started a body of work that um, early in 2022, uh, January of 2022, um, mm -hmm. the scale painting, and yeah. uh, this was included. And it took me quite a while to complete it. I finished it, you know, just before winter solstice, uh -huh. which is where the, the title Night Prayer came from. Uh -huh. um, and my paintings are very, um, like you said, kind of slow. They're, I, I kind of consider them kind of holding different kinds of spaces. Um, they hold energy in different ways. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the process of the painting is really important. So they're all started, this included, but they're all started on the floor mm -hmm. and they're, they're poured. So they're very physical. I treat them like a watercolor. I kind of move the painting around in different orientations and I use different methods of pouring like squeeze bottles, spray bottles, buckets. It's really active at that mm -hmm. stage. And then once that and that kind of space is resolved, I prop them on the wall and I build them very, uh, very, very slowly um, with kind of thin, with, uh, scumbling which is dry brushing and mm -hmm. um glazing and i hand sand um between layers and I, I developed this process actually when i was an undergrad and then i stopped doing it for a couple years when i got to grad school and then i revisited it in, in 2014 when i um when i became a reiki practitioner mm -hmm. and i felt really connected i don't know i felt very connected to the process of of kind of holding energy in a space and sanding and kind of preserving the history of, of the process within the surface of the painting. And so mm -hmm. when I say they're built up really slow, um, they're meditative and I, I think of them as like the way kind of a crystal might be formed. Um, mm -hmm. Like they're, geo they're like geological uh -huh. and I build, build them up and I build them up and I sand and they kind of speak to me and they tell me what they want, to, want me to do. So mm -hmm. I feel like there's a presence that's kind of in the painting itself, in the surface, but then there's also a presence that I have to have with the painting mm -hmm. in order to make it because it's a lot of kind of active listening. Um, and then color, of course, um, this is going to sound funny, but a, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, I started thinking about polychrome or full spectrum as a parameter mm -hmm. <laughs> in my paintings which is crazy because before that I was working a lot with subtle variations of of warm and cool like uh -huh. you know like a red violet with a red you know and yeah. so they almost view, were perceived as monochrome until you looked at them up close and they were yeah. very prismatic more prismatic but with this I was like I don't really paint full prismatic paintings uh -huh. and during the pandemic I was like I really need a I needed it like I yeah. needed to like paint every single color of the rainbow in <laughs> <Yeah. and> <laughs> different variations so that's kind of where it started and now that I I, I like kind of am there it's hard to kind of go back now yeah. that I've been 
kind of fully immersed in the rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so thinking about that as like a way of healing too, as yeah. like these paintings being like a source of light yeah, and, um, and like, like an, a source of awe almost like yeah. you're encountering something that you, you, that is familiar and un, unfamiliar at the same time. And, yeah. and, and with this painting in particular, because it's so vertical and so big and immersive, it relates to the body in that way. And then it. I just want it to, I want the paintings to feel kind of like intoxicating in a way yeah. um, with the color. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, so they totally, do. <laughs> and um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so I had this comment that, that I, you know, as a presenter here in a webinar, you know, we all know that we do these webinars and it's like people forget to move the images forward. I would like to just have this image up for the entire webinar. Okay, great. <laughs> I have other work, so I won't be <laughs> doing that. But I want to make the point to the audience that to me, your works are some of the slowest paintings that I have ever seen. I really feel like we're in a kind of Rothko territory here where it's really incumbent on a viewer to really engage with your work, to really give themselves to the painting to really allow themselves to have the experience of this incredible atmosphere, the range of colors that you're talking about. Um, and so, so much of what you're saying is absolutely uh, resonant with my experience and also adding to it in terms of some interesting, learning a couple interesting new things. I'm gonna just advance it for a second so that people can see a kind of close up detail of some of the scumbling mark making that you're talking about. And then I'll also show an edge. And I wanted to ask you a question kind of about um, beginning and ending because you know at the end of the day, you, you scrape the paint on the side of the, do you wanna talk a little bit about how beginning and endings happen for you, say on a daily basis or even across a, you know, multi-week, multi-month uh, experience of making a painting. Yeah, I can start with the edges because that's that's sort of um, a, a way that I, that's really direct that I mm -hmm. think about um, rec recording time. Um, mm -hmm. My paintings are so much about time, whether it's immediate, slow, different paces of time within a painting. And um, and the edges are really every at every session, at the end of a session, I just scrape whatever's on my palette and I kind of plop it right on the edge. And for me, that's, it's also, you know, it's lots of things. I'm being resourceful with the paint that I have, but mm -hmm. also I'm creating um, a record of that, mo that, that period or that process. And then I'm also kind of being playful and mm -hmm. just not really taking myself too seriously. Uh -huh. um, and, 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 you know, and there's a physicality um, that I, I like on the edge too, because yeah. it kind of counters or contrasts this kind of atmospheric depth that happens in, in, the, the center of the painting or the, the majority of the painting. So then it kind of pushes the painting, it forces the painting to recede in a way, which I mm -hmm. think is is also spatially interesting. And yeah. then, I mean, there's all these, and then it's like reinforcing that it's a painting too. Yeah. Um, so there's all these things that are kind of at play in terms of the edges. And and I, I really get excited about edges because I feel like there's there's like a party on the edge a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, like if you look, you're like, oh my God, because it looks like, wow, this is like an intense painting, you know, yeah. it's very intense. But then if you look at the edges, it's, it's kind of silly <laughs> in a way and fun. And so I like, I, I like that kind of contrast. Um, and then just in terms of time, I mean, because of the, the, the laborious nature of the paintings, just the, the because I'm sanding and, yeah. and I can't really work on a painting every day. I have yeah. to kind of shift between a group of paintings. Yeah. Um, I have, I start a large group of paintings at once and yeah. then I work between them. Um, 
And so they all kind of happen at the same time or they start at the same time yeah. and they end around the same time. Like I finished them and how do I, and I don't really know um, to respond to or answer the question about like, how do I know when I'm done within yeah. a painting too? Yeah. It's sort of, I'm after a feeling, Yeah. Uh, but also I'm, I'm really interested in, contrast within a painting and I really associate them to sensations in the body I'm a yeah. long time um Vipassana meditator and yeah. um so that's a practice that I do every day and yeah. so it so when I think about a painting instead of naming it and kind of like labeling it this or that I really yeah. want it to have these sort of contrasts like is it atmospheric or is it is is there parts that are atmospheric and opaque or is there is it dense and and uh, light you know these kinds yeah. of things that kind of could function together but also create a tension at the same time if that makes sense yeah well as you said i mean the paintings talk to you i like your phrase active listening um and then this is interesting because of course this is a smaller painting much smaller painting. And so uh, you work small as well as large. And here, yeah, what are you, what, what's it like when you're doing something on this scale? I mean, to be honest, like the smaller paintings sometimes take me as long as the large paintings. <laughs> sure. I actually feel very, um, I, re I really like the differences though, yeah. because small, even though they're, I think, as challenging for different yeah. reasons. I like yeah. the intimacy of them. I yeah. like that you can kind of sit with them and they're kind of like these, they hold this space and they're like almost, I don't know, they're they're more precious in a way and, in, and, and you can kind of see the mark making in a different way because yeah. of the scale. I mean, I don't really... I, I don't really um, use different size brushes um, yeah. for the small paintings. They're all the same. And yeah. so, and I, that's kind of intentional too. I've tried various things. I've tried to make small paintings look like large paintings. I've tried to yeah. do, you know, but I think um, what's most important is like the, that there's sort of these contrasts again within a small painting. And sometimes, you know, they need to be denser in areas for them right. to kind of, feel like immersive feel the same way even though there's a, a smaller scale well I mean you know it's it's also just part of how one I think it's interesting that you're taking on the range of how we um connect to paintings because obviously with a very big painting that you know is bigger than you are that you could if it that you could literally walk into if it was you know a space and you do viewing them and making them must be tremendous you know part of that experience is allowing yourself to kind of be present before this thing engaging with it but also going up and reading distance the whole conversation are we looking at this from a hundred feet away are we looking at this from six inches away and your work is very rewarding at all distances but you know we're also very familiar with looking at a smaller painting that you can basically put your head inside of in a way like really be up there visually and optically in 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 these moves and you know in a painting like this one you have this beautiful veil almost to me of like a certain kind of mark that's more perhaps the you know indicating painterly surface you have painterly depth and you still have the edge the whole edge conversation i mean it's almost becomes folk you know Phobus, point to list, informed by a lot of different kinds of of things, and then when you again have a bigger painting, it's really interesting that that they do such different that they can all that that, that they're all doing things. Thanks. I really like. I mean, I love. That's why I really like shifting the scale. Like sometimes it's impractical to work on a bunch of massive paintings and not know mm -hmm. what's going to happen with them or where they're going to go. But those kinds of shifts really kind of feed the smaller work. Mm -hmm. and vice versa and so I like that kind of conversation that happens I'm constantly like thinking about ways to shift my work you know but subtly yeah. like I think for the last few years I've been actually trying to be kind of more consistent in a way um in terms of space uh -huh. as another sort of parameter because I think I like to push things in different directions um yeah like with color especially. Um, and that's why I'm like, okay, this is actually the only painting um, 
I think this last year that I made that's just a full on yellow painting. Yeah. Yellow is my, my, I mean, I, there's a lot of color in this. There's, <laughs> if you look at it up close, there's a lot yeah. of color, but I consider it yellow, but yeah. yellow, I've, I've made a ton of yellow paintings over the years. Yeah. Yellow is kind of my heart center. Like I feel really connected to yellow, uh -huh. um, but, but I've been trying, like I said, to kind of, treat the small paintings and the large paintings with the same kind of time and mm -hmm. even utilizing a similar palette just to see what happens you know yeah. so this is this one was actually different in that regard um but then in this one there's this center that's really you can't see it in this image because it's it's a large painting but yeah there's a lot of layers that are in the center and it's built up really thin marks and it's very much related to my drawing practice yeah. um i mean I, so that's where that comes from yeah well we're gonna get to some drawings i think later you have this unconsciously beautiful book you did of these ether series uh which is just so so incredibly beautiful it's like revoltingly wonderful <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> um tell me a little bit about no it's just like the, the audience need, you'll have to say where so what's the I don't have a copy of it but it's a beautiful book it's this big and it's all the ether drawings and who if people were to say go online and wanted to look it up what's the publisher and what's the full title it's it's called ether drawings and yeah. it's that nautical nautical is the book the publisher yeah. um and they it's this the, the book is really stunning it's like yeah to scale of my drawings. So it's a pretty substantial book. And there's yeah. there there's writing by two of my dearest friends yeah. in the in the book too, Sine Woods and Molly Larkey. And then there's it was really a record of the pandemic. It was lit I made I had a daily practice from April 20th of 2020 to um April 20th of 2021. And I made a draw a drawing a, a drawing a day next to my son's crib basically it was that's where I made them and um at night and it was kind of a curated selection of those of those drawings yeah we have a pretty nice crowd here in the webinar and I'm very uh zoom incompetent I'll just say that right now but if people do have questions they can probably put them in the chat or the Q&A Rima might be better than me but someone has asked what your relationship to beauty is oh I mean <laughs> I love, I, I feel beauty. I know like there were, beauty was a bad word maybe 10 years ago and <laughs> when I was in school, but beauty is so important to me. I feel like I only want, I, I really, I think beauty is actually not just what, what is beautiful mm -hmm. kind of on the surface, but it holds all di different kinds of um, kind of tensions. Like beauty is like, I think like my paintings, like I really want them to feel beautiful at first glance but then when you look at them up close um there's a crudeness to them too like mm -hmm. there's actually a textural component to them that from the surface of sanding so there's this built-up history like you know like a tree ring or something you know like there's there's something um i think that that that's beautiful that's what the kind of beauty that i want to convey in the work mm -hmm. um but beauty is super important to me just in general i think about you know, like awe a lot in my work. And, and that's very much tied to beauty and, and sort of the invisible, like what, like there's so much, I think about potential and color and like, yeah, and, and, and how that can kind of um, create some sort of communion or connection. Mm -hmm. um, so that's beauty to me also, if that answers the question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, um, it's in, it's interesting what you're saying. I mean, there's I feel like painting is this very radical place right now. Um uh I kind of feel like we were part of this we were I mean, I went to school in the late 90s. Um and there were so many things that are inherent that are part of painting that we were told at that time were just over, you know, forget it whether you're talking about figuration or uh, whether you're talking about uh, how, you know, trying how you might want to try to connect with people or things like beauty. I think it's paintings in a very radical place. Cause I think with this effort to try to like break down these hierarchies of 
whether it's some kind of East Coast, New York driven or New York cologne driven hierarchy, whether it's white males. In terms of like, I think right now painting is such an accessible medium to people it, and there's so many new makers and buyers and we're just really seeing, we may have felt like we were done with painting in quotes or whatever, maybe been told that, but painting clearly wasn't done with us. And I think at a time when you're literally dealing with like chat bots, you could fall in love with a chat bot online or whatever, you know, um, I think that the irrationality that's at the core of human experience and the organicism that's there is this incredible thing that I think beauty in the broad way that that you uh, answered that question or pointed out the many aspects of it is is incredibly fundamentally important to human experience making and viewing alike. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's subjective, but we long for it. I mean, we've been yeah. we've gone through so much the last few years, you know, just yeah. during the pandemic, through the pandemic and and kind of trying to seek some sort of connection through that. And I think beauty is really important and whatever that is to you, it's just trying to kind of connect and and something else to focus on It's something optimistic to focus on, too. I mean, like nature. And I mean, that's why I think there's this rise in in um and painting but like abstract abstraction but also yeah. in landscape painting you know there's this longing for yeah. connection to nature and to to an experience like a human tactile experience and so yeah. i think that's what what i consider beauty in an art context I guess. yeah no it's it's incredible and it's such a it's i feel that very strong very strongly i i feel that um that, that this engagement is very palpable and important for 21st century people, not just how people were considering beauty with, you know, the, the changes in Paris in the late 1800s, which is, of course, the a whole conversation about the start of modernism and what people are looking at and thinking about not only human experience, but, but new, new knowledge. Like you mentioned, your own color knowledge. Like, of course, you know, you have people like Seurat that are reading, is it Chemond, the writer who's really articulating color knowledge. Um, but, you know, just really reflecting that actually we're not... <laughs> We're not, we're still, we're, it's, these things are very important to 21st century people. And there's a lot of things that we do differently as 21st century people like in your own work, but yet also relate to other kinds of, your work to me relates to, to the history of different things. I think about like the opticality of high modernism or Joan Mitchell or, but, or, but Nymphaeus, Monet and all sorts of things of what it feels like to be in something like that anyway. Um, I don't know if you have any responses to that. Um, so the, what about also just how these lines and shapes form and, you know, sort of this kind of, of feeling here. And we're also very much getting towards the end of the webinar. So maybe there are things that we haven't talked about that you might, you might want to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, we can talk about how the, the kind of patterns emerge if that's I think that's I it, like I said it's not something that's conscious mm -hmm. um but I do think that's why I liken it to a, like a crystal being formed yeah. because when I'm sand when I'm when I'm building up a painting it like they'll I often kind of create these sort of segments of color that then I, I don't really know how to articulate it yeah. better than the removal or the kind of excavating of the surface creates a mark that I then respond to and then build on top of. And it's, it's this, this kind of, this pattern, these patterns emerge. And in this one, um, as it's called silence and I title all my paintings after they're made um, mm -hmm. with the exception of night prayer, actually, mm -hmm. I knew that was night prayer, maybe th three quarters of the way through. I knew that mm -hmm. that painting was what that was going to be partially because of the timing that I, I made it but um this it really felt like the, it was sort of like I was trying it was a, kind of a a call for silence but mm -hmm. also the coolness and the veiling and this kind of curtain that was appearing to me really felt like kind of this peaceful abyss Mm -hmm. um, and that really this like the, there, there's these kind of linear like straight lines that happen through the sanding that I then respond to and then 
there'll be another one. And then I, I'll kind of create another line and that's how it develops. Yeah. And, and with this painting too, I really wanted there to be a subtle shift from the left to right. You can yeah. probably see it now that I'm bringing it. Totally. But that's something that I want to have. I've been doing in my paintings for a little bit, for a while, a couple of years now, where I really want there to be a, a physical transformation within the painting. Um, yeah. And so, and this one is definitely more subtle, sort mm -hmm. of like how kind of something emerges slowly and, um, and thinking about what silence is, mm -hmm. and it's not really silent, actually. There's so much noise <laughs> within silence. <laughs> so there's that too. <laughs> But um, yeah, and, and and the edges too in this one, there's a lot of linear elements within the edge too that kind of create this sense of um, light and shadow or volume. And yeah. I've talked to you about this, Philip, but I'm like a train, I'm an observational painter, you know, yeah. like I was trained as an observational painter sure. and I used to make a lot of observational paintings alongside my, just for a lack of better word, abstract paintings. But I yeah. do feel like there's, I think a lot about light and shadow and how these things function both observationally and then also internally. Um, yeah. And that's how, how, and so with the edges in this one, it feels very observed in a way, like there's a sense of light shifting yeah. from the right to the left in yeah. that way. It's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful work. Um, so we're kind of here, kind of getting towards the end. So maybe we'll just end with a couple of these, the works on paper, which are really amazing. If you see anything here in the webinar that you want to email me about, you know, feel free to, to, to send me an, an email and there's things online. Do you want to talk just a little bit about your, your drawing <laughs> practice? And we'll look at a couple of these. They're so good. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're made with acrylic wash and water. Oh yeah. The arches. Tell us what acrylic gouache is, because I there's a lot of people that I'll see them in the gallery and they're looking at the checklist and they're like, acrylic gouache, what's that? Well, gouache is, I mean, it, acrylic gouache is actually made by Holbein. I think there may, might be another brand that also yeah. makes it, but you can actually mix it with acrylic and gouache. Got so it. it's not as fickle as traditional gouache. Yes. Um, but the pigmentation of it is... Um, very much more like oil you know like there's it's more saturated and you don't yeah. get the sense of um with acrylic unless you're using a lot of mediums and stuff and uh, it, you don't get the sort of plastic sort of yeah. quality with, that you uh, can get with acrylic sure um and i treat i mean i don't use acrylic i really use it as a like more like a watercolor and yeah. and also like my paintings i scumble them and um and these are all made in one sitting. Um, yeah. And I, like I said, I made these by my son's crib what, during the pandemic at night. So they would take, you know, an hour, two hours, sometimes at the most. And I, they are also sanded. So I'd run outside on the balcony and sand them, wipe them down, and then bring them back inside. And so there is a surface quality that is, is obviously not as um as sanded as the paintings but there's yeah. a sense of that in the in the surface of the drawings and i consider them drawings because um they are very immediate and yeah. and the way that i think about them is much more like a drawing than a painting and that's really where the optical mixing came from mm -hmm. um during the pandemic i was trying to kind of create a a way to um, make the drawings feel energetically like my paintings, but fast. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing a lot of this mark making to create these optical mixtures. And that's where that came from. And then it went and entered back into my paintings in a more direct way. Interesting. Um, yeah, but I, I really love me. I, I, I really love making these. Um, at the time I was really thinking about them as channeling sort of this collective energy of yeah because we were all online and at home yeah. and I, I had a newborn, you know, my son yeah. was born in, in September of 2019. So he was very young and I was, you know, primary caretaker for half of that time. And, um, and, you know, so I was really with him all day and then making these at night, but also absorbing all of this stuff that was going on. And, yeah. and so they felt, and there were on the back side, there are the dates and information about the days in some yeah. cases. Um, yeah. So there are also records, you know, yeah. there's this real, um, 
So it's real chronicling of time and, yeah. and energy. That's why yeah. it's called ether. Um, yeah. I really felt like I was channeling energy in these. Yeah. Well, there I I'm so thrilled that you took the time to chat with me today, and I'm so thankful that everyone could come to the webinar and join us. I just, um, yeah, I'm somewhat humbled talking to you because I was I just I just feel like you know so much about painting, and every time I look at them, <laughs> I just see all this new stuff, and it's just such a wonderful experience for me. So not to be all gushy, but <laughs> I really do appreciate it, and so. The show closes tomorrow. If you're in Glasshell Park, which is between downtown and Pasadena in LA, please come see it. And then feel free to be in touch anytime with what we're doing with Rima. And we have some things we're working on. So really excited about that. Rima, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Philip. This is a really nice conversation. And All thank right. you to everyone who joined us. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. We'll talk later. Bye. Bye. Thanks.